Have you ever been fighting at something for a long time and then you finally achieved the victory? Have you heard something like that happen to you? Because uh, I did. This past month, I achieved a victory that I had been battling for a long time with the California DMV. And I want to tell you about that <laughs> today. My name is Buzz and I serve here as the lead pastor. And uh, I was blessed to live in California for seven years where my wife was born and raised. I was potentially even more blessed to leave that great state just one year ago to move here to Wyoming. And so when you move, you got to take care of a couple of things, right? And one of them is tags on your car. And I hate going to the DMV, man. Like, I don't really know somebody who's like, that's how I want to spend a free Saturday. But in California, it's terrible. Like, you have to make an appointment months in advance. And then when you show up, like, everybody has also made an appointment for that same day. Hundreds of people in line, like one worker, and they, like, their motivation is the sloth from Zootopia. You remember this? Like, I think that was filmed in our local DMV, absolutely, for sure. And you just wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you get to the front, and they're like, oh, you didn't have this form. I didn't know I needed the form. Oh, we invented it five minutes ago. You need to leave. And like, you know, it's just a struggle. So when I moved here, I thought, okay, I'll go down to the DMV. It's going to take me all day, but I'll just fight this battle. But wouldn't you know it? Like it took me two minutes in the DMV and uh, there was no line. In fact, there was like a party. They had like confetti cannons for me and they had like a cake that was all laid out. It's like, sir, we have planned for you expectantly. In fact, we filled out your forms for you in advance, or at least that's how I felt about it. And we have two cars, a minivan, because I'm super cool and have a lot of kids. And that was easy. Uh, And then my red car. And they're like, oh, you actually don't have the right form for the red car. But why don't you call California? They would love to serve you in this way. And it would be so easy to mail you the form. And so I thought, okay. I'll do that. And thus began my battle of 14 months of battling with this DMV from long distance. I needed an environmental inspection for my car that you can only get in California. But I was like, man, my car is not in California. I'm 2,000 miles away. I'm not driving for a smog check. Email and virtual email. And then they started mailing my forms to my old place in California. And ah, ah. Finally, I got my documents, went down to the DMV, confetti cannon once again, unbelievable. Cake, once again, unbelievable. It took me like one minute and I thought, man, Wyoming is the place for me. Got my tags on the car and I dropped my kids off at school that week. And this mom, who I kind of know from kids drop off, she's like, oh, you were finally able to let go of California, huh? And I was like, man, you have no idea how long I've been (laughs) battling to escape their clutches. So if you see my car in the parking lot, just give the Wyoming tag a little high five the battle, right? We all have these battles in life and some of them are more trivial like the one I'm sharing with you today. Some of them are serious, life and death. Maybe you feel like you're in that kind of a battle today. And man, I wanna encourage us from the scriptures this morning that they have life for us, they have hope for us, and that the battles and journeys that Jesus Christ, our savior, fought for us, accomplished for us on the cross are hope and truth for us this morning. No matter what battle you're facing, Jesus is in it with you. You might even be here today and say, I'm not yet a believer in Christ. And my hope for you is that you'll see the truth of Jesus in the scriptures, that you will feel encouraged and that you'll feel motivated to put your faith and trust in him today. Maybe you're here and you say, I have followed Jesus all my life and I feel like I'm in a fight. My hope for you is that God will give you a lift of hope and truth and life. I mean, that's our vision here at Element Church is to guide people to experience life to the fullest, connect into meaningful relationships and make a lasting impact. And the truth in the scriptures today, I pray will bring you that life and hope and peace that we need. You know, here as we continue in week six of our Silver Screen Jesus series, we're looking at narrative principles that we already know, already use, and already understand, applying them to the Bible. So you know what it's like to be in a fight and to win. I just told you about it, right? This narrative principle we actually call the climax. Uh, the climax is when the hero faces the enemy that they've been preparing to conquer for the whole story. And so for me, that was the DMV. I don't know what it is for you in your life right now. And not every single narrative and story has a battle against an enemy with a climax, but many of our favorite stories do. You always know who the villain is. You always know who the hero is. You know who's in charge and who's likely to win. I think we also know, just somehow we know deep in our hearts that the hero will overcome somehow. We don't know how. We're excited to find out. So we have a couple examples from movies So like in the movie Gladiator, we see a slave imprisoned, used to be a general, Maximus, Decimus, Meridius, and he has this final conflict against Caesar, the evil Commodus. 
who's robbed him of his family and all of his hope. And so Maximus overcomes with the truth and honor of his cause and the loyalty of the soldiers who let that fight play out in the Colosseum. This is the conflict that the whole movie has been pointing at and Maximus will overcome. Maybe your parents didn't let you watch historical fictions like this when you were a kid like me. So maybe the best that you got was this movie. It's a great movie, right? (laughs) Lion King, you guys seen this? Seen it on Broadway, seen it live action? Because the epic battle that unfolds here is between Simba and Scar. This is the villain Scar, his uncle who killed his dad and cast him out where he just wandered out in the wilderness, Hakuna Matata-ing it up. Then Simba finds out, actually Scar's the one that killed my dad and comes back to set his people free for Scar and his pack of hyenas. That's the pinnacle battle that we're all waiting for, hoping for, and want to see how the hero will overcome. And of course, what discussion of last battles would be complete if not for my very favorite one? This will shock you, right? Star Wars. (laughs) Star Wars, right? So Luke Skywalker here is taking on his father, Darth Vader. Spoiler alert, but it's been out since 1981. And so not just battling this villain, Luke has to actually overcome his own need for revenge, his temptations for anger and hate, He has to believe the truth that inside of his father, there is yet some virtue to be pulled out. This is the last battle, both against themselves and against each other, that the whole series has been pointing at. This is the climax. You know what a climax is. You know what a battle is. You've seen it play out on screen and in your life. And so today, I wanna look at John chapter 18 and see how Jesus undertook his own last battle as he ministered to us here in this earth the climax that his life undertook as he lived and ministered and suffered and died for us. We'll be in John chapter 18 for most of the day. And if you don't have a Bible today, we would love to give you one in the living room or next steps wall, just across the hall. I believe that the scripture can change your life and I wanna bless you with it. If you have your phone, you can for sure get it out. We'll also have the text of the scripture on the screen, no matter how you access the word, it is the word of God for us today. So let's look at John chapter 18 and see what the gospel writer John writes for us in verse 28. He tells us that the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas, who was the high priest, to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and so to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and he asked, well, what charges are you bringing against this man? Well, if he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate said, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So here we get the very first steps of Jesus facing his final conflict, his last battle, the thing he came on earth to overcome, that suffering and death on the cross. But I want us to understand a few things about Jesus' last battle, because firstly, it's not a battle in exactly the same way that those film examples that we saw were. It's like Lion King, it's like a fictional story. In Star Wars, it's possible that Luke Skywalker could lose, but Jesus is not a fictional story. It's true. It happened. And Jesus also does not have the possibility of failure. The life and ministry of Jesus is not the story of some underdog hero who against all odds was able to scrape through to his destiny. In fact, if we look at verse 32, it tells us that this type of death was done to fulfill what Jesus had said all along, the kind of death he was going to die. In other words, he has full responsibility He has full agency. He's in control of his own destiny, even to suffer and die. And he doesn't suffer and die because he's temporarily losing the battle. He suffers and dies because this is the plan all along. Jesus is in control. That's almost the second thing that I see here is that Jesus is in control, but nobody else wants to take the final responsibility for Jesus, do they? Of course, in that day, the Jewish people were subject to the Roman Empire. And that meant it was only the Romans who had the legal authority to execute somebody. And so here we see the Jewish leaders are trying to observe their religious and their legal law and yet pull on the Romans for their authority for execution. They feel like Jesus needs to die for his claim to be God in the flesh, 
For them, this was like an unspeakable blasphemy. So they try to put the ball into Pilate's court and get an execution. But Pilate is standing here and he pushes back a bit, doesn't he? He wants to know the charges against Jesus, but there's not really any, are there? Not as far as Rome is concerned, because if he was a criminal, where's the rap sheet? But the leaders are like, man, trust us. If he wasn't a criminal, we would not have brought him here. But there's nothing to put your finger on. There's nothing to point to. There's nothing that they can say, this is what Jesus did wrong. In fact, all he has done is tell the truth his whole life, whether it's setting people free from disease, whether it's preaching the good news of the kingdom revealed, whether it's telling the truth that he was God, come in the flesh to set everybody free. Jesus lived a life of truth from day one going forward. So here, it's ironic a bit that Jesus is the only one who takes responsibility at all. Caiaphas won't, Pilate won't, but Jesus is here on purpose to put his life on the line for us. And so even though the Jewish leaders and the Romans are arguing about whose authority, Jesus is the real authority. He's the one in charge here. Pilate does, though, eventually agree to question Jesus to determine what sort of charges might need to be laid. And here's how John tells us about what happened, starting in verse 33. Pilate went back inside the palace and and summoned Jesus and asked him, "Are, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied, because your own people and your own chief priests have handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. I love this conversation because Jesus is speaking to Pilate, not like a prisoner condemned, not like a person on trial, but as an equal or even as a superior. I mean, he lets Pilate know, like my kingdom is not from this world. If it was only this world I was concerned about, Jesus is saying, My followers would fight for me, but I'm not concerned about becoming like Caesar. I'm not concerned about becoming like the high priest, Jesus says. I have a bigger view and a grander mission in mind. I'm here for the whole of humanity. I'm here for everyone, much bigger. Jesus takes the responsibility, not just for himself, but for all of us. He's come to seek and save all of humanity through all of time everywhere. People keep missing it, man. How many people in the gospel of John have looked Jesus in the eyes and come away missing the truth of who he is? How many people look him fully in the face about his life and ministry and come away unchanged? It is a tragedy. How many of us have looked at the truth of Jesus and came away unaffected? We just missed it. It's kind of like these videos. Have you ever seen these videos of professional athletes who dress up in costume and then come out to like a regular person's athletic event? Have you ever seen these? There was one that was kind of popular a couple years ago. And uh, I think it was Kyrie Irving dressed up in stage makeup. And Kyrie Irving's like an all-star NBA player, one of the best in the world. And he looks like an old man and he's coming out even on his walker out to the courts. Have you seen this? And then they give him the ball finally, and he just unleashes the full repertoire of his Hall of Fame level NBA abilities. And he's driving past people. He's dunking the ball. And they're like, how can this old guy be schooling me on the court? It doesn't make sense to match what you look at with the accomplishments. But I remember the looks on everybody's faces when this old guy began to just school everybody. I loved it. I loved it. Just the joy of the unexpected (laughs) breaking out. And here I feel like Jesus is acting a bit like that isn't he? I mean, he's dressing up like Kyrie Irving did, cloaking himself in human flesh, appearing to be something that he's not fully. He's playing the part like that basketball player did, allowing himself to be captured and tried and questioned to make it seem like he doesn't have authority, even though he really does. 
It's almost like Pilate looks at him here and sees only that old man, not worth anything. How could this possibly be a king? A man in chains, king of the universe? It doesn't make any sense. Not just a king, but something even beyond the king. Yet Jesus continues to teach and embody whatever he has throughout the entirety of this gospel. He is the king in word and in deed and in truth. God appearing in human form. And so as readers of this gospel or as Jesus' original followers, we will have some advantages that Pilate doesn't have. Because all Pilate has is a snapshot of Jesus right in front of him, somebody in chains like Maximus was in that movie or like the old man, like that basketball player was in that clip. How can this be a king? It doesn't make sense. It's almost worth making fun of and scoffing about. And yet the king takes enough responsibility. He takes final responsibility for everybody because Jesus continues to boldly proclaim truth and boldly show what he has always been about. I mean, this is the battle that he's been preparing for his whole life, the final climax, the culmination of everything that he is moving towards. But we have seen it coming all along the way. We've seen Jesus demonstrate his lordship. We've seen Jesus demonstrate his kingship. We've seen who he really is every step of his ministry. I mean, even in our series, we've seen it. We saw in John 1 that Jesus is God. We saw him make the claim that God himself, the creator, came to earth as a human person to regather his family. We compared it to the Star Wars crawl, right? It's the beginning, the window at the beginning that gives the end away. And so Jesus here before Pilate is the same Jesus. Jesus is God. We saw it in John 2 as well, where Jesus is bringing new wine where he's bringing joy and celebration and a renewed and transformed family. We used our principles of characterization to show that the kind of Jesus who puts a family together will continue to do that even in the midst of his last battle, not by passing the responsibility to somebody else, but by taking it up fully and giving his life to those who need it. It's the same Jesus. We saw it in John 4, where Jesus was the living water, The same Jesus who sits down here with Pilate is the same Jesus who sat down with that woman by the well at that meet cute gone wrong, but better than ever could be expected. He offers Pilate the same kind of living water that he did to this woman. If only Pilate would reach out and take it. If only we could reach out and take it. It's the same Jesus. And we saw it in John 10, where we taught that Jesus is the good shepherd. He taught us that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And now we get to see Jesus do it. Not just teach us about it. He's living it out and accomplishing it. He's winning that battle for for you and for me. Even last week, we saw it in John 11, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, showing us he has power even over death. He brought Lazarus back from the grave and he's showing us rather than telling us how powerful he is. And so it might seem like Pilate or the high priest has power over Jesus because he's in chains, but they do not. The same Jesus that raised Lazarus from the dead is still king of the universe. He's still the resurrection and the life. And he's kind of asking Pilate the same thing he asked Mary and Martha. Do you believe this about me? He's asking us too. Ask Pilate this question and Pilate gets to answer it. Do you believe it? That the creator of the universe came in the flesh as a person bringing new family, new life to everybody who believes. Do you believe it? That his suffering and death and resurrection has paid the penalty for our sin and give us our new relationship with God. Do you believe it? And Pilate gets to answer. And it's kind of sad. Because in verse 38, what is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and he said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it's your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. 
And do you see Pilate's answer there? What even is truth? You get a sense almost of his sarcasm, of his sadness. Almost like he's hoping against hope that there might be something true and transcendent in Jesus. I love how the author Frederick Buechner put it in his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Comedy, Tragedy, and Fairy Tale. Uh, Buechner depicts Pilate as somebody like who's stressed out, somebody who can't sleep, somebody who's barely hanging on to their goals and their dreams of rising through the ranks and becoming one of Caesar's friends. He hits obstacles every day in this province of Judea that's just tough to govern, is losing hope, and after yet another sleepless night is confronted face to face with Jesus. And Jesus had just said, everybody on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate, it's like the world's not even about truth. <laughs> what even is that? The world's about what works. Like it's about what gets me through another day. It's about what keeps me in power. It's about what I have to do. It's like Pilate's fighting his own battle against himself. He's like, I don't have time for spiritual philosophy. What is that? Must be nice to think about truth, but I've got a region to run. I've got stuff to do. Must be nice to have time to think about things like what even is true? But we know something that even Pilate doesn't. We know that Jesus alone is the truth. We've seen it the whole gospel, that Jesus is the light, that Jesus is the new wine, that Jesus is the living water, that he's the good shepherd, that he's the resurrection and the life, that he is the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through him. We've seen it. It's not an idea or a set of facts or words from a book long ago. Truth is found in Jesus Christ alone. He's the king. He's the hero. He's winning the battle do you know this? Do you believe this? I think actually many of us do, but sometimes we don't live like we do. We don't act like we do. We act more like Pilate does, honestly, and think, man, it must be nice to worry about truth and to have time for that, but I got problems in my life that need to be solved. I have to do what it takes to get through another day. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever exchanged the truth of Jesus for these lies of pragmatism in our world? Do you know that Jesus is the truth? You know it. You know it in your head. But sometimes the world battles back and it's like, how can Jesus really be a king? He's a man in chains. How can Jesus really be God? He came as a person. How can this Jesus who you can't even see, how can he be everything to you? How can he set you free? But it's the message of John chapter 18 that Jesus is the final truth and that he does win the final battle. And we can claim that truth even for ourselves because in this world, man, it's a fight, isn't it? It's a battle, isn't it? But I think Jesus has given us some weapons of truth even to use on our own behalf. And here's what I mean. Like if you know that the enemy is pressing in on an area in your life, you can find a scripture, a, a truth with which to fight back. I call these attack scriptures. And what these let you do is replace the lies of the enemy with the truth found in Jesus Christ. It's a way to use these supernatural weapons to win these sorts of battles that we've been fighting our whole lives. And so when these times and attacks rise up, you can strike back with the word of God, just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the desert. And so, for example, maybe sometimes you feel lonely, you feel abandoned, and you feel like God has just forgotten about you. That's a lie, but many of us have heard it. We can attack back with the truth according to Psalm 139, just like we sang in a song today, that there's nowhere we can go from the presence of the Lord. There's nowhere we can flee from his spirit. If we go to the depths, he is there. If we rise to the heights, he is there. He is always with us. Or Matthew 28, which says, I'll never leave you, I'll forsake you. I'll be with you always to the end of the age. And as we 
reflect on these scriptures, it reminds our, our hearts, our soul, even our body that God is with us. We replace that lie with the truth. Maybe you feel anxious sometimes or worried and, and you can claim Psalm 127 that says, unless the Lord builds our house and watches over our city, we build and labor in vain. It's in vain we go to rest early or rise early to work, eating the bread of anxious toil, the scripture says, for he gives to his beloved sleep. As we claim that for ourselves, that reminder that God is watching over us and building and working, we can rest in him. That's the truth, is that God gives peace, not the lies of our world. Or maybe you feel like you're relying just on substances to get through the day. Maybe an addiction to food. Maybe an addiction to caffeine. Maybe nicotine. Maybe something harder. Maybe you feel like you just need one more drink to calm yourself and get through the day. Whatever I put into my body, like that's the sustenance that I need. It will work. It will get me to tomorrow. Maybe you need to push that lie back and, and claim like Jesus did that man shall not live by bread alone, by substance alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. You can tell yourself the truth about Jesus and push back the addictive things of this world. You can. The truth sets us free. If you're believing other lies even, that maybe you're not worth it or maybe your marriage is hopeless or maybe it would be better if you just gave up on this Jesus thing after all, Man, push those lies back with the scripture. Whatever your lie is, the truth will overcome it. Jesus is the truth. And that truth, Jesus has set us free. Almost in an upside down way so that he can meet us in our weaknesses and in our most frail moments where you feel like you might be losing that final battle. Jesus steps into it with you and is strong for you. I mean, he overcame. So I've already challenged you the last couple of weeks to be in prayer for one who needs Jesus every day for 30 days. But maybe you need to add to that list these types of scriptures that will remind you of the truths in the moments where you need them and put them on your mirror and put them on your lock screen and write them on your wrists. Whatever you need to keep the truth of the scripture in front of you, man, the truth sets you free. Those lies have no hold on you. Not compared to Christ who won everything at the foot of the cross. And I'm telling you that you can win these battles, not because you can win them, but because Jesus has won them for you. In fact, John tells us how he won it in verse 15. He tells us that the crowd shouted, take him away, take him away and crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. And so finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near their city. And the sign was written in Aramaic and Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but write that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And I love this from Pilate because he understands something intuitively or almost accidentally about Jesus here, that the truth about Christ is not up for debate. Jesus is the truth, whether you believe it or not, whether you reject it or not, whether you accept it or not, Jesus is still the truth. I have great empathy for Pilate here. I hope that his encounter with Jesus caused him to even rise to the level of a believer. We don't know, the scripture does not say, but it was clear to me that he was fighting some internal battles and this battle over what to do with Jesus was perhaps the biggest of them all. I think he felt trapped, right? It's like, okay, on the one hand, I can condemn this innocent man 
who's done nothing wrong and save myself from the crowd, or I can let this man go free. And then the crowd might come for me. I have to bear the cost of my decision. He feels trapped. How can you choose for a Roman governor? There's no win there. I think many of us actually are facing some battles sort of like that right now. We think over here on the one hand, it's the right choice, but I can't pay that cost. Or I can make like a wrong choice and save myself some heartache, but I can't do the wrong thing. I'm stuck in the middle with a cost I'm unable to pay. And like Pilate, we have to decide something. But I think that's the key difference between our last battle in life, our decisions we have to make, and those that Jesus fought for us. It's almost like we don't have to make these choices because Christ has suffered and died and fought for us so that we don't have to. We don't have to battle against our sin because he battled and overcame our sin. We don't have to battle against death because he battled and overcame death or worry or anxiety or substance or loneliness or every single kind of sin and plague of this world that just attacks us. Jesus has overcome it so that we don't have to. He fought the battle. You don't have to. You don't have to be stuck. You can be set free. So I don't want us to be like Pilate. I don't want us to be like Caiaphas, the high priest. I want us to be more like Jesus and take responsibility. I mean, can you take the responsibility today to follow Jesus, to go where he leads and live like he does? Maybe for some of us, we need to take that responsibility to follow Jesus for the very first time. And you know that he's been pulling and tugging on your heart and you know, man, today is the day to say yes to him. Maybe for some of us, we've been following Jesus our whole life and yet we hang on to these battles and think it's mine to fight for myself. Maybe today is the day we need to lay it all at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, fight this battle for me. This is what you came to do. You are the way and the truth and the life and I need to be set free. In our Savior's ministry, before coming to the cross, he had one last supper with his disciples where he took a meal, kind of like this one, not really like this one, and used it as a picture of what he was about to do, what we just read about in John chapter 19. Um, so we gave you some communion elements on your way in. If you didn't receive these, if you would just put your hand in the air, we'd love our usher team to come around and serve you that we might partake together. If anybody needs communion elements and would like to partake with us, just put your hand up that we might serve you. Thank you, Lori. I see a couple here in the, in the center. Just leave your hands up. One thing I love about communion and remembering and celebrating is its ordinary elements, things we use every day, bread and juice, food and drink, normal stuff. How can God be in the normal stuff of our life? And yet he is. And he tells the truth about it and he sets us free from it. And what's more normal than being alone? What's more normal than being anxious? What's more normal than being plagued with sin? And yet, what is more normal than being set free by Christ, our Savior, crucified? So he took bread, just like this, if you would take with me. And he told us that it's his body, which is broken for us, that he paid the penalty for our sin on that cross. And that as we eat it together, we can remember him. So let's eat together and remember the sacrifice Jesus has made for us. In the same way, he took a cup like this and he said, this is like the blood that I'm pouring out for you for the forgiveness of sins, a new agreement between God and humankind that you don't have to be stuck anymore. You don't have to battle anymore. I have set you free. I have paid the price. I have overcame. Let's take and drink together and remember the sacrifice of Jesus for us.
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? And, and before we pray, as we do bow our heads and close our eyes, is there anyone in here today who would say, I need to say yes to Jesus for the first time. I wanna accept his free gift of salvation for me. If that's you, man, would you be bold enough to raise your hand and let us know that we might pray with you and for you? Is there anyone in here who wants to say yes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Man, if your hand is in the air or even if it's not and you wanna declare by faith, just pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm stuck in these battles in this world. I need you to set me free. I believe that you are the truth and the life. Save me, Lord God. Thank you for inviting me home. Would you all pray with me? Lord Jesus, we have seen clearly who you are, that you are the light of the world, the new wine, the resurrection and the life, the good shepherd. And yet God, sometimes we feel like we must fight our battles for ourselves. Lord, forgive us that we walk into spaces where you have already won the victory. Forgive us that we hang on to pieces and parts of our lives and ourselves that we should have long ago given to you. Lord, forgive us that sometimes we believe the lies of this world and not the truth of your son, Jesus Christ, risen and resurrected and revealed. Forgive us. Lord, today by your Holy Spirit and through the power of your written word, would you set us free to see that Jesus alone is the truth, that Jesus alone is the life. Lord, help us to put ourselves evermore into his hands. Thank you, God, for winning that victory at the cross. Thank you, God, for rising again three days later. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming again soon to set everything once and for all and finally right. Even so, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Can we give God thanks for new life in Jesus Christ? Yeah. That's amazing. And so whether, uh, if you said yes to Christ today, you have to tell somebody. And we have a way coming up on the screen for you to do that, simply sending a text message. Even if you didn't say yes to Jesus today and have recently, hit us with the same text. We wanna connect with you and support you and walk with you and encourage you in the truth of Jesus Christ. It's a long journey and we wanna be here with you. And so whether you need prayer today with our prayer team down front or whether you wanna meet us in the living room across the hall, don't leave here without sharing a word of peace with somebody who loves you and who wants to help you follow Jesus Christ better. And so as we go, would you allow me to offer you a benediction or a word of blessing? And so may our Lord Jesus Christ, who is truth personified, help you to understand the truths that he believes about you that he loves you, that he forgives you, and that he has set you free. Go in peace to serve our God and King. Amen.